I love flowers. You know, I still remember when my first grade teacher asked us what we wanted to do when we grow up. And I answered, I want to work in a flower shop. Now, as it turns out, I ended up getting a doctorate in plant biology, and I did research on the genes involved in plant reproduction, which is what this lesson's about. I created this lesson not just for students, but also for other AP biology teachers to help us put this topic into the framework of the new AP biology curriculum. So on many of the slides, I included statements about the enduring understandings and essential knowledge that the College Board specified in the AP Biology curriculum. I hope you find it useful. Now, the first question I'd like to ask you is, do plants have sex? Now, you might look at me strangely and think, what? These having sex? I never heard of that. Well, let me ask you one more question. What is the purpose in life? Leaving religion out of it just for now. Biologically speaking, what is the purpose in life? Well, here's your first AP Biology essential knowledge statement. Your evolutionary fitness, how uh, successful you are considered to be as an organism is measured by your reproductive success, the ability to have children and pass on your genes. So yes, plants, just like other organisms, have sex. And sec uh, the flowers are the sex organs of angiosperms, which is the scientific name of flowering plants. So yeah, this is where it happens. Hmm, I wonder if that's why men give women flowers. Hmm. Well, let's go on. So first, your lesson overview. First, I will tell you about the structure of the typical flower and some of the different pollination strategies that plants have. Then the angiosperm life cycle, which is also called the alternation of generations. Then fertilization, and I'll tell you about some interesting stuff that goes on in cell communication, how cells communicate with each other during the fertilization process. And then about embryo development, the role of fruits, and a little about how seeds germinate. Then I'd like to give you a little overview of the differences between animal development and plant development. And finally, I'll just briefly touch on the asexual reproduction in plants. So first, you need an overview of the structure of a typical flower. And I'll use both this diagram and the photo of a wild rose to illustrate the floral organs. The outermost organs are called the sepals. They are the green leaf-like organs that surround the flower and they protect the flower bud. Next are the petals. These tend to be colorful and showy to attract pollinators such as the honeybee. Then the male reproductive organs, the stamens, which here in the rows you can see these little orange and yellow things, those are the stamens. And then in the center is the female reproductive organ, which is called either the carpal, the pistil, or the gynecium. And I'll just use the term carpal because it's pretty commonly used by scientists and it's probably the easiest one for you to remember. Now let's look in more detail at the reproductive organs. So the stamens are the male reproductive organs, and they are composed of a stalk-like structure called the filament, and at the top is the anther. This is where pollen gets made, and inside pollen are the sperm. Then the female reproductive organ, the carpal, has at the top the stigma, which is very sticky so that it can capture the pollen. And then this, um, there's a stalk called a style, and at the base you have the ovary. And inside the ovary are one or more ovules. The ovules have eggs inside. So when the pollen uh, falls onto the stigma, the sperm can get towards the ovules to fertilize the eggs. Now, not all flowers have the same structure. For example, not all flowers have petals. Um, maize, um, also known as corn, these flowers don't have petals and sepals. Why? Well, because these are pollinated by wind. They don't need to spend the energy to make a structure such as the petals because they don't need to attract pollinators. They just need wind. However, they do have stamens and carpels. And the other difference is that they also have separate male and female flowers. 
So the top of this corn plant, these are the male flowers. And you can see a close up here where the stamens are visible. And then the corn ears are the female flowers. So hidden inside this corn ear, you can't actually see them, are many, many female flowers. And those silks that are sticking out, those are the stigma and style. So when the pollen falls from the um, male flowers down on the ears, it's captured by the stigma and can fertilize the eggs inside the corn ear. And then that becomes the corn kernel, which you eat. So like I just said, some flowers have separate male and female flowers. So let's look at it in more detail. So um, certain flowers are called complete. If it's a complete flower, it means that it includes both the stamens and the carpels. And you can see that on this tulip. Here in the middle is the carpel, and then these little brown things are the anthers of the stamens where the pollen is made. Other plants have are incomplete flowers. Incomplete flowers have either stamens or carpels. So separate male and female flowers. And an example of that are hollies, which you're hopefully familiar with from Christmas. So only female hollies make the red berries um, because the red berries actually come from the carpels. Now many complete flowers, the ones that have both male and female reproductive organs within the same flower can actually self fertilize. Not all, but some, such as this peanut flower, are not dependent on wind or pollinators to deliver the sperm to the egg. So I'd like to ask you a question. What is the advantage to self-fertilization? Think about it. What do you think is the evolutionary advantage to the plant being able to self-fertilize? Well, hopefully you realize that self-fertilization ensures your reproductive success. If the plant is not dependent on any other factor to deliver the sperm to the egg, it can be pretty certain that it can have children and pass on its genes. Thence, hence, it will be reproductively successful. Now, I'd like to ask you one more question. Is self-fertilization the same thing as asexual reproduction. This is actually a common student misconception. So I'd like to put it in really big font. No, self-fertilization is not the same as asexual reproduction. Meiosis still produces sperm, and a separate meiotic event produces the egg, and the sperm needs to fertilize the egg to produce children that are different from the parents. So self-fertilization is not the same as asexual reproduction. Now, some plants cannot self-fertilize. For example, the holly, which has separate female flowers on one plant and male flowers on a different plant, actually on a different shrub. These have to cross-fertilize. That means that the pollen from one flower has to be delivered to the carpel of another flower. Now, if self-fertilization ensures your reproductive success, why would cross-fertilization have evolved? If you can do something that makes certain that you have children and pass on your genes, why would this system exist? So what? it has to have some advantage. What is it? Well, it has to do with genetic variability. Um, Self-fertilization still gives you children that are different from the parents because you have separate sperm and eggs still being made even though it's on the same flower. But cross-fertilization gives you more. There's more genetic variation through cross-fertilization and this is a huge advantage. For example, if a certain disease hits or if there's a drought, if all of the plants of a particular species are genetically identical, then um, they might all die out. But if they're not genetically identical, if at least some of them can survive the disease or survive a drought, then that ensures the continuation of the species. 
So in general, cross fertilization is better. If you can do it, it's better in the long term success of the species. So a lot of plants have actually evolved blocks to self fertilization. And so these are having separate male and female flowers, such as the holly, or having different maturation times of the stamens and the carpel. For example, this American bellflower. It is a complete flower. It has both stamens and carpels, but they mature at different times. So when the pollen is ready, when the sperm is ready to, sell, uh, to pollinate, the carpel's not yet ready. So um, bumblebees actually have to spread the pollen to a different flower. So you still have cross fertilization. And another block to self fertilization is something called self incompatibility. This also happens in complete flowers where the carpels actually have the ability to block the pollen from the same flower from fertilizing. So this is really interesting how it happens. I'm not going to go into it now. I'll leave that for your college more advanced courses, but there's really interesting cell signaling going on for how the flower recognizes what is its own pollen and what's pollen from a different flower. And it only allows the pollen from the different flower to get to the eggs. So anyway, these different blocks of cell fertilization summarize some of these multiple processes that plants have to increase their genetic variability.